a lot. And maybe just to pursue that issue of civil liability, um, I mean, even if civil liability stays as something that's there that people in theory have the right to access, let's say you have a corporation based in Ireland guilty of gross human rights abuses in Latin America, and you have you know, an indigenous farmer or activist who is trying to pursue that justice. At the moment, we don't have any legal aid in Ireland for civil liability uh, cases. So if, if we don't deal with that, is, is this going to be a meaningful accessible remedy for people? No. So unless they, those supports are put in place. But again, if the directive obliges that there is civil liability and access, then that becomes the opener of the gate for these things to be, have to be put in place. And they've been long advocated, by the way, to be put in place. But um, and these cases have to be funded in different ways. Um, but also, Deputy, and thank you for your question, um, you know about the people who are affected taking the case. If there was criminal liability, and many of the abuses mm. are at the level of the egregious level, as some I've just mentioned, then it would be the state taking mm -hmm. the case. And it's not the person who is most diminished, most vulnerable, most marginalised, etc. The farmer, the human rights defender, it's not them, it's the state. But that's, yeah. I recognise that's not on the table. You can imagine that keeping civil liability in those circumstances is, is crucial. But it's still placing an enormous burden on the most vulnerable, and also there are a lot of barriers in practice to even accessing it. Could I? Yes, sir. Just a very quick comment. The new draft Spanish law is looking at creating a fund for cases so that by the member states or so by the Spanish government, which seems interesting. Okay, so that could be a possible yeah, yeah. model. Yeah. Um, just in relation to this other. I mean, another major part of attempting to water it down is to exclude pension funds and alternative investment funds like hedge funds. Um, obviously, that's very relevant for Ireland as a centre of finance capital and the role of the IFSC, etc. Can you outline why it doesn't make any sense to exclude these companies from responsibility from what, what, what happens? But the financial sector is not in the directive um, and as a high risk uh, or uh, sector. And that, it, that is strange, and I think it's 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 quite um, it's it's a pity, and, I, and it's one of the calls that we're we are advocating for the financial sector to be included because the OECD guidelines are there for a financial sector, and they are a part of that process and, and framework. So I don't understand why. And if you if you think back to the uh, what Deputy Stanton was saying about the support from businesses, uh, the support is there from investors too um, for this directive. So I, I I don't understand why, and particularly for. I do think it's something that the Irish government, considering our market and our, where, where we sit, should be looking for the inclusion of the financial sector as well. And I don't understand why. Yeah. I might just add to that that they are included to the extent that the due diligence is done at the point of signing the contract, okay. yeah. but not over the life, which is at odds with, for example, project finance, where you're looking at an infrastructure investment in Saudi, you would have to look at it across the life in markets, for example, or geographies that have inherent high human rights risks. Um, the other thing I would say... As, as in, just to clarify that, that's like, as long as they can show they did their due diligence at the point at the of point. the investment or whatever, then and that's if everything deteriorates, practice, they're, they're covered. 100% okay. deputy, that's out okay. of step with practice, so nobody understands that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the issue in Ireland is we can have very small amounts of people um, employed in, in a business with very large amounts of assets that are investing in all kinds of things. So there's a chain, if you like, of command and of, 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 of how those impacts... Um, trickle down, so excluding them doesn't make any sense, so I would say that an exception or some particular uh, interest point there for Ireland. The other thing I would say, just in passing, is that a lot of the foreign direct investment companies in Ireland will be coming within this directive, yeah. or all of them. Yeah. So another reason to get involved. Um, which one, I have a question for probably for Mary, which is that one of the interesting things that struck me in the um, Make It Your Business report is there's a reference to a study done by Trinity in 2019, which I think you're listed as one of the authors on, um, which analysed 60 of the largest firms operating in Ireland, and it found that 34% of those publicly listed companies scored zero against every human rights due diligence uh, indicator, and 72% failed to disclose whether they assess salient risks and impacts. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? And if you know, has that, has that statistic improved at all? Well, this is something we started a few, a couple of few, I think that was the third one, and there will be another one next okay. year. Okay. 
Um, the idea is to measure compliance on their own published information with the UN um, guiding principles on business and human rights. So, so it's only what they've said themselves. Uh, so it is, uh, it is quite shocking, actually, that uh, they are ill-informed and, and uh, don't understand their obligations. That being said, uh, we have noted over the last uh, two um, benchmarks, as we call them, that more business is willing to engage now and that there have been some improvements with some companies as a result of being benchmarked by Trinity. So we're hoping that this will act as a kind of a motivator and create awareness and lead to behavioural change by companies here. Thanks a lot. Just one final thing in terms of the motivation, and we're speculating a bit here, for the government being a, a laggard on this issue. Um, the point was made that, well, Ireland is home to a lot of SMEs, etc. But I do wonder, is it, is, it not, is, it, is it not also a part of it, the fact that Ireland is, is home to a lot of multinational corporations that base themselves here? Um, five, uh, the five top global software companies, 14 of the top 15 medical technology companies, 18 of the top financial services companies, and we know that Ireland... Inc. kind of markets itself globally as low corporation tax, low data protection, low regulation, and is part of this driven by showing that like they're not trying to put too onerous burdens on corporations, etc. I mean, I think um, it's very hard to say. I think the reality is that legislation is coming. The era of voluntary compliance with voluntary guidelines is over. It's long gone, really. Um, legislation is coming. The question is, will Ireland be at the table to influence that legislation in a positive direction, or will Ireland essentially adopt um, an inert position on it, which is not Ireland's practice or tradition? Um, so I think what we need to see is political engagement, and we need to see it happening um, with a degree of urgency. Ms. Dollar. Uh, just, just referring back to the benchmark and the companies, we obviously benchmark the biggest companies, and a lot of them are multinationals here as well. But if you look at someone like Microsoft, Microsoft, uh, I was part of their consultation on bringing in a 10-year human rights policy. They are, they're a company that are uh, deliberately and uh, thoughtfully uh, deciding that they have to engage in, in proper uh, due diligence and proper human rights impact assessments of you know of their of their work of their stuff so so it's not i don't think it's beyond the the beyond the reams of possibility that other companies wouldn't be uh, similarly willing to engage but it it is a, a case of understanding what's involved and then changing their behaviour, if for no other reason, as we've seen so often in the past, because they have been uh, found guilty in awful circumstances, like, for example, uh, Rana Plaza, uh, whereby they had to change their behaviour in order uh, to protect their reputation. Thanks, Thanks. Laura. Thanks, Deborah Murphy.